a marine biologist, I'm not the usual speaker for an economic and a special interest group, but you will, I think, understand, you know, the relationship of the two as I go into my presentation, you know, the economy of nature and what we can learn, you know, from natural systems that might help us to rethink the economic system itself. So you know, speaking about the economy of nature, it's really saying, can we find some design principles for a new economy uh, by looking at other kinds of systems and, and how they work you know, around the world and what they've learned over perhaps millions of years of, of evolution. And of course, we know that the economic system is not working very well, but we do know that we need new models, that they should aim to be a dynamic, just, and thriving social order. And so it's not just how much profit we can make, but what can we actually improve the social order and respond to people's needs. And therefore, an economy that's strongly altruistic and cooperative in nature, how do we create meaningful employment for every human being on the planet is an enormous challenge. And then eradicating poverty in the world. I mean, you know, we have an economy that creates great wealth, but we still have half the world's population struggling to make ends meet. So there's clearly some problem. The economy is not serving the well-being of the majority of the people on the world. I'm a system scientist, and so I always look at systems approaches to the different challenges I try to address. And we can see that organized systems follow similar principles and models that show how they increase their efficiency and diversity as they evolve and perfect themselves. If you look fundamentally at almost any system, its organization is determined by its information content. Information is stored in various ways depending on the level of organization. So you have physical systems where the information is really mathematical formulae for how you know, heat flows. In chemical systems, it's the different atoms you form molecules and the molecules have characteristics that mean they react in different ways. In biological systems, it's information stored in DNA and that is used to you know, sort of design, run the various processes that create biological or organis or organisms. In our social systems, you might say we have two major knowledge systems, the knowledge of science and of religion, or at least the, the, the values that determine how most societies function, you know, more or less. Of course, in the economy, information is stored in various ways. It's stored in, you might say, financial values, its basic values, which are presently things like competition and profit. You know, the corporation says the first thing is to be as profitable as possible, and everything else is secondary. And you compete to find who's the strongest to drive out the competition and build a monopoly position. Uh, there are information also in financial accounts. And of course, GDP is one of the, the basic ways of accounting how the economy is working, how much money is flowing through the economy. You also have information stored in intellectual property, in material capital, and in human capital. I mean, I'm sure that the, the director general of major corporations consider that their human capital is a very important part of, of their company. But in the economic system, social and environmental capital are treated as externalities, so they're ignored, producing market failures like climate change. And also in real systems, there are no equilibria product actors. Much of the economics still functions on 19th century scientific concepts, which have long since been replaced as we know more about how dynamic and highly variable systems are. So where can we look for a solution to the economic problems we're facing today? Is there an example? of a natural system that works like an economy, only better. Or maybe you could say, how would an economist look at the world's most complex natural system, in this case, the coral reef ecosystem? This was some research I did back in the early 1970s, when with three colleagues, you know, young radical ecologists, we said, we're going to do a computer model of the whole coral reef ecosystem. So we do a little matrix of 104 by 104 compartments and determine what were all the interactions between different compartments within the system. Uh, and we were looking at carbon flow, which is very similar to say money flow in an economy. So very close to GDP, how does carbon flow through a natural system? And of course, for each the interactions, we then worked out quite a complex model. And I'm sure economists would feel comfortable with this kind of thinking. But it was certainly rare you know, at the time more than 30 years ago in, in the biological sciences, but we did try to work out for each compartment, how it relates to all the others and what we controlling different parts of the process. We, we, we plan to you know, carry this through as a research program. Unfortunately, National Science Foundation had to choose between physical oceanography and biologists wanting to model coral reefs, and they chose the ships rather than us. So while we had assembled 80 scientists over 10 years to collect the data, we finally only could publish the theory of the model 
and never could collect the data to actually work out the calculations. So let's go to the more interesting side of coral reefs. They don't have to be do done in an economist language of figures and diagrams and graphs. You know, a coral reef is more than figures, but we can learn a lot from it as we, as we dive down onto it. And I'm, you know, I don't know how many economists you have to use scuba for their work, but I certainly had to early in my career. So what is a coral reef? It's an ancient, highly evolved ecosystem. You can find fossil corals 20 million years old that look very much like corals on reefs today. It's extremely rich in its diversity. There are lots and lots of species on it. It's a highly productive ecosystem, but it exists in a resource poor environment. Those beautiful tropical waters are so transparent and clear because they're, they're biological deserts. You know, they're clean out of any black, black other thing. there's very little in them. So you really have a rich system functioning in a, might say a biological desert. <clears throat> They're also very dynamic. They're constantly changing, but they're resilient within certain limits. You're gonna be smashed by a cyclone and the, all the corals are scrambled up, and then they will bounce back again, the system regenerates. So they're quite an amazing system from that point of view. And of course, corals are colonies of animals. Here you can see a, a coral, you know, all the individual animals reaching out with the, the white things with the little tentacles, trying to find any bits of plankton that may drift by in the water. They're not many, but they have to keep trying to collect a little more material you know, for the system. And coral reefs line many tropical coasts. They're in fact, the world's largest structures built by biological activity. You can see them from space. And there's some reefs in the Pacific where they have drilled down to see how thick the skeletons are. And they found more than a kilometer of skeletons before finally hitting the volcanic basement. So if a coral reef is growing at say a millimeter a year, you can get some idea how long it would take to accumulate a kilometer's worth of, of skeletal accumulation. And of course, more than 500 million people live within 100 kilometers of reefs. And so many people depend on reefs for part of their nourishment, for coastal protection, for tourism, many other things. So they're a very important resource in many tropical countries. Corals have to grow in shallow waters because they need light in order to function. If you have the reefs farther offshore, they form a barrier reef, like the Great Barrier Reef of Australia, where you have a whole band of, of coral reef with a sediment behind it, and then a deep lagoon you know, behind it. Sometimes the reefs will form what's called an atoll. It's a ring of coral around with you know, some, perhaps some land or lagoon in the center. And you know, this, is a, this is perhaps the world's smallest atoll, at Rose Atoll, on, on one kilometer, one kilometer, but it still has a reef around the edge of it, two tiny islands and a lagoon in the middle. And of course, this is what a reef looks like when it's lifted out of the water. So you have islands that have now coral rock lifted out of the water and uh, you know, onto, on a kind of a platform. And the person who worked out this process was Charles Darwin, where he published in 1842, how a volcano would form and the reefs would build out around the edges on the top diagram. And the sea level rose, uh, and therefore the volcano sank, the reef would keep growing, leaving only a rig of coral and lagoon at the top. And so here we have an ecosystem that builds its own environment. And so you have reef that's building very deeply as far as light can penetrate, and then you have on the reefs of the very dense coral growth of many different kinds of coral growing quite rapidly and building out the reef quite effectively. On the you know, top where you have the waves, the reef has to be very strong to resist wave action. So here you have a sort of a, an algal crest, you know, sort of cemented together by, by plants with, with skeletons as well. And then behind the reef, you may have seagrass beds and algal beds and others helping to produce a lot of food for the fish on the reef that come and feed you know, in these meadows. And so you have the corals building a whole community of many different forms, all living together, very much like human communities that, that we build. And you have systems nested within systems. So you have some kinds of animals living within skeletons and others growing on the surface and communities of invertebrates and of fish and so on, clustered together in various ways. So it's really quite complex series structures all across the reef system. And of course, each organism has its own form and functions. This is one example of a coral. You can see what's called a, a brain coral. Then I mentioned there are coralline algae, or there are plants that produce calcium carbonate skeletons like the corals and cement the reef together. And they're the kind of the glue that holds together all the, the bits and pieces of coral that form the reef. Then you have, say, the green alga here, Alameda, which you know has little segments that have a skeleton. And when it dies, it produces grains of sand. So the typical white sandy beach you know, in a, on a coral island is made entirely of fragments of animal and plant skeletons. So even the, even the sand is generated 
by the coral reef ecosystem. So how can the coral reef provide a model for our economy? I might answer that little island there is, that's where I had my research laboratory when I was working at the Smithsonian Institution. We were working on the Belize Barrier Reef. So talk about small island communities that it's about as small as you can get, one house on a very tiny island. So if we start, let's say energy efficiency, and here we see a system is very effective at capturing the maximum solar energy available. You can see with all the forms and structures that it makes, how it is able to create a lot of surface to, to absorb light. Another interesting thing about its efficiency is that the coral reef tries to maximize its total productivity. In our economies, it's the one most productive you know, process or company that crowds out the rest and you know, sort of takes over. But on the reef, you have some very efficient corals and plants, other things. And the next you have some that are perhaps less efficient, but they can work in niches that are you know, perhaps not the, the optimal, but they're adding something. And even down to say, boring algae inside the coral skeletons, capturing the last few protons of light that everything else has missed. And therefore adding something more, total productivity. Every organism has its place in the reef system, includes in some way to the, the wealth of the whole. Well, it's a very rapid energy transfer within the system. You know, corals with animal plants living inside of them, fish feeding on the, the algae and then being feed, fed, eaten by others and so on. So you've got very complex food chains across the reef transferring energy. And they use the energy very efficiently. Very little is lost from a reef. Anything that is released by one thing is quickly grabbed up by something else and kept within the system. So there's very little waste within the system. It's highly efficient from that point of view, unlike our present throughput of consumer economy today. You can just see here the very complex forms that are created to make as much you know, light surface as possible, just like the leaves on a tree. Corals have to have light because they're symbioses of algae and plants together. So the animals need the light in order to grow effectively. And I mentioned corals are a symbiosis of animals and plants. You know, if there were no plants in this picture, it would be perfectly white because corals are colorless, but they have lots of algae living with inside their tissues. The coral animals fertilize the algae and the algae provide food to the corals. And so they work together in a very efficient system. Another dimension of the ecosystem or the economy of the, of the coral reef is how it may keeps its populations in balance. As I mentioned, there are multiple levels of control. In balance, you have dynamic change, but if one species multiplies a little too far, something comes in to bring it back into balance again. And if another is affected by a disease, something will come in and move in and fill that space and replace it for a while until it can come back again. So you'll get a series of control processes maintaining an overall balance of the reef system. With its high efficiency, you can maintain this very high density, even in the resource poor environment because it captures energy so effectively. And it creates additional space to increase the population. In the same way that we can squeeze more people into a city by building high rises, so the coral reef can make space for more organisms, more productivity uh, through its three-dimensional structure. And the great diversity of shapes and forms of coral allows overall density to be even higher because there are many different spaces that others something can fit into and find a little lifestyle for itself as part of the process. The result is you get this extremely high density and diversity of corals on a healthy reef with extremely high biological diversity. On the Great Barrier Reef, there are 400 species of corals, 4,000 species of mollusks and shellfish and things like that, 1,500 species of fish just on the Great Barrier Reef. And of course, you get then this complex spatial organization, just like a city. In fact, you might say it looks rather like a city. Or perhaps you could say a city looks like a coral reef, rising up in the same way with balconies and with various things, trying to get a little more sunlight and so on as they go. This happens to be Monaco. And so what you have the system is creating additional space to squeeze in more and more productive activities within the space available you know, on the reef. You might say a coral was like an apartment building. It's each little place where a coral animal can come out looks just like the balconies. Or you might say, you know, an apartment looks just like a coral. You know, and functionally, they've been driven by certain phenomena to get the maximum access to, to light and, 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 and resources. Among the kinds of population control, we have example of the crown of foreign starfish covered with poisonous spines that crawls around dragging out its stomach on the reef and digesting and killing the corals. Now on a healthy reef, they simply maintain a balance. 
if they get if they have a population explosion get out of hand, as they have in some cases, they can devour the entire reef and kill off all the corals. Normally, they help to keep the balance. Then you have say things like the parrotfish. They have beaks like a parrot, and they go around taking bites out of the coral. You might think this might be bad for the coral, but in fact, every bite is a little bit of vacant space that a coral larvae can come and settle and start to grow, and therefore they again help to maintain the diversity and balance of the overall reef. In terms of resource management, we've got this highly evolved integrated system taking care of resources in a very effective way. It is a high standing stock, even at the upper levels in the, in the food chain. The effective capture and storage of scarce resources, efficient management of materials flows. It's just like a circular economy. Everything is linked to everything else. Any waste from one part becomes an input into the part of the process and so on. Over 20 million years, they've learned how to iterate very effectively. Hard coral dies off. You may have a soft coral coming in to take its place, at least for a while. <clears throat> and of course, the system that avoids excessive consumption with a high productivity, and high energy efficiency, efficient transfers in the system, and effective recycling, it's all in balance. It's not consuming to the point of, of destruction of resources as we see too often in our present consumer society. And so the wealth is created and maintained within the system in a balanced, effective way, as we should be doing in our economy. We're very high soccer fish as well on a healthy reef. You can, hundreds and hundreds of fish is like swimming in an aquarium. And even in terms of waste and pollution management, the high recycling rate, there's little loss from the system. You have this diversity with many different feeding strategies. So that there really is no waste from the system and no real pollution. Everything is captured and recycled and maintained within the system. For instance, the, the sea urchins are part of the waste collection strategy. They crawl around scraping up any little bits of loose organic matter you know, that, that falls, you know, falls down onto the reef surface. Even the sponges are there filtering the water and taking out anything in the water that may be worth eating. So you might say that the coral reef system functions on the basis of cooperation and integration with many different kinds of symbioses, collaboration, things working together with mutual assistance much better than the competition in our present society. Every organism contributes to something, the well-being of the whole. And with the balance of the coral regulation, you have this complementarity in its diversity. Just a few examples. Here, for instance, we have one particular fish that is always found next to this coral, because with the dense branches of the coral, predator comes along, they can all dive down and hide in their branches and escape from the predator. Or you may have the damselfish, that cultivates its own food. It's a, it's a farmer fish in a sense. And you can see it's growing its food supply of algae around it. It will chase away and it comes into its little territory and quite successfully maintains a little part of the reef producing the food that it needs. Or you could have the cleaner fish. You would think it'd be dangerous to be brightly striped and yellow and blue and black on a reef full of predatory fish. But on the contrary, this fish eats parasites. And therefore, if a big predator fish comes along it will open its mouth so the little fish will swim inside and pick the parasites off its teeth and clean its gills. And the big fish is obviously enjoying getting rid of the little itchy things. And so it won't eat the little fish and the little fish gets its food. So this is the kind of cooperation you see on a coral reef. Another example is the anemone and the clownfish. Again, the anemone is brightly colored in yellow and white and black stripes. You think about the danger, it will swim back and forth attracting big predatory fish. When the fish comes chasing after it, it will dive down into the anemone. Now the anemone has poisonous tentacles and therefore will paralyze and eat the big fish. And then the clownfish gets the table scraps. So one attracts food to the other and the two together you know, live quite successfully. <clears throat> so what are the equivalent human values, what we see in this natural system? The symbiosis on the reef are a bit like cooperation and respect and solidarity. The balance of the reef is like moderation in, in human system. <clears throat> you have a, the kind of justice as a place for everyone. Everything has its way of you know, existing on the reef and supporting all the others. You have decentralization with coordination. There's no dictator running things, but they've evolved multiple ways of balancing and, co and assisting each other without the need for some central direction. So you have, really have unity and diversity <clears throat> on the core reef as we should be aiming for in human society. So you might say, is this a model for economic system? Clearly it's sustainable over many centuries. It's a dynamic, just and thriving natural order. It's strong, altruistic and cooperative in nature. It provides meaningful roles for every organism in the system and creates great wealth in an environment 
that is poor in resources. So this is really what we should be aiming for in our own human system. And in fact, our planet is like a coral reef. It's also highly dynamic and resilient within its limits, but it's also fragile and easily degraded and pushed beyond its natural limits. And in fact, we can see how vulnerable it is over exploitation to pollution, to climate change, biodiversity loss. We're going far beyond a whole series of planetary limits today. And so our planet is rapidly declining, just like coral reefs. This has been predicted since 1972. At the same time that with my you know, little radical ecologists, we were trying to model a coral reef, there was the team Levadan you know, for the Club of Rome, produced reports on limits to growth. And of course, they predicted their scenarios back in 1972, showed that you know, with business as usual, the, you know, the system would function quite well until about 2020 to 2030, and then the civilization would collapse. They then repeated the models you know, 10 years later for the Rio Earth Summit. They said in the models, if we waited beyond that in, in the end of 2015 to begin to make the change, it would be too late to avoid a catastrophe in mid-century and the level of the quality of life possible much less because we're destroyed to much of the resources of the planet. That's the limits to growth. So those are models. Where are we now? So I went back to say, how good were those models from 1972? And in fact, the data has tracked right along with the models. We've done slightly better on births and deaths, but apart from that, everything is going right according to what the models predicted. And nothing says that we're not going to be able to avoid that catastrophe in the near future. And of course, we can see it on reefs as well. People go fishing with dynamite, we have pollution that smothers the corals with algae and so on and so forth. And we have with climate change, bleaching of corals where the beautiful colors on the left and turn totally white when the te temperature of the water gets to be too high. So are we destroying the best model for our own future? Can we consider going with our economy? Can we, in time, can we transform it for a dawn of sustainability rather than a sunset and devastated planet? I'd like to leave you with that as you're thinking for is this model we can somehow adapt what we need to do to solve our economic problems? And that's for you, the economists, to find a way forward. Thank you very much.